Well, on October 3rd, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued a declaration making the last Thursday of November special. He called for a day of national thanksgiving, praise, and prayer to render homage to the divine majesty for the wonderful things he's done in the nation's behalf. The Battle of Gettysburg was a few months before, and the Union had a bloody but a turning point kind of victory in the Civil War. And he was thinking about that when he issued this day of national thanksgiving, thanking God for his blessing on their effort. And looking back over 150 years, we can certainly see how God's hand of blessing has been on our nation. And from that day to this one, we got a lot of things to be thankful for. Uh, I know, like I've already mentioned, in my own life, I, I think of all the many things God's given me in friendships and family and in the material blessings I've got. This day, I intend to follow through on the President's declaration and gather with my family in Louisville, Kentucky, and give him thanks for the things he's done for me. Y'all going to do that? Maybe not in Louisville, but you're going to be somewhere giving thanks, right? Amen. Right. And as I was thinking about that, I got to do some of that yesterday with my parents and my sisters. Uh, it's really obvious that not everybody is going to be giving thanks in quite the same way this year. Because uh, some of us are going to get to see family we haven't seen in a long time. And we're going to be really grateful for that. The Thanksgiving's just going to kind of bubble up. But at our family's tables this year, uh, my, my microphone keeps dropping out. Is that going to bother y'all? No, you're going to be okay? If it does bother you too bad, just... Like, wave your hand, and I'll grab this mic, and I'll, I'll, I'll hold it, you know, and I'll be good. I can do it. I can do multiple things at once, as you well know. I am a man. We specialize at multitasking. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, well, some men are better than others, I guess. That's all I can say. <laughs> but the reality is that uh, that joke couldn't have come at a worse time, because I want to be sensitive to the fact <laughs> that everybody's not going to be given thanks that there are going to be a lot of empty chairs around dining room tables this Thursday. And while you know in the back of your mind that, yeah, we should count our blessings and all that, heartache is really real, and grief hurts. And so there are going to be a lot of grieving families this Thursday. First Thanksgiving, matriarchs. First Thanksgiving without matriarchs. What are you going to do? How are those families going to be thankful on a day of Thanksgiving when it's like that. And I think for people like that, I don't, I don't know if you're in that situation or if you know people who are, I think the book of Ezra was written for you. I think God put the book of Ezra in the Bible for people who were struggling to believe that God was really good and that he was really faithful. And so I hope this morning that as we see his faithfulness to his people, Israel, that your hope and your confidence and your trust in God is shored up so that you can see maybe something of God's goodness even in the midst of really difficult circumstances. Uh, what I want you to see this morning is pretty simple. I want you to see that God is faithful to his people and he always fulfills his promises. And I think if I could summarize Ezra in one sentence, that would be it. What's the message of Ezra? What, what did Ezra want God's people to understand? Simple. He wanted them to understand that God is faithful and he always fulfills his promises. Uh, Ezra tells the story of God's people's return from exile. Um, it covers a span of about 80 years from 538 B.C. to 457. The people came back. To Jerusalem. They reinstituted sacrifice. They rebuilt the temple. They renewed their covenant with God. That's the story of Ezra. But while it's the last historical narrative in the Bible, it the, tells the events that happened last in the story of the Old Testament, uh, it wasn't the end of God's story. There's more to come. But if you just read through the Bible and you skipped over Ezra, you would miss the beautiful way that God ties up the loose strands of his relationship with Israel. You know, uh, we read in the book of Genesis that 
God called one man out of ancient Mesopotamia, a guy named Abram. And he said, Abram, leave your father's household and come to the place I'm going to show you. And so God brought Abram all the way to the promised land, and he told him he was going to give him that land, and he was going to bless him, and he was going to make him a great nation, make him a blessing to the whole world. But Abraham never got to possess that land. He lived as a wandering nomad. When God blessed him with a child, Isaac, he got to see maybe the down payment on the faithfulness of God's promise. Then Isaac had children, Jacob and Esau. And God blessed Jacob and changed his name to Israel and gave him 12 sons. And those 12 sons, as some of y'all know from Bible study this morning, eventually find their way to Egypt where God shows his faithfulness to his promise and blesses them, preserves their life through famine. But over time, their circumstances in Egypt changed. And they became slaves to the Pharaoh, and he abused them, mistreated them, and they cried out to God for a deliverer. And the book of Exodus says that he heard their cry, and he sent Moses to set the people free. And over a period of about 40 years, leads them wandering through the wilderness until finally God proves his faithfulness to Abraham and fulfilled his promise to give him the land, and through Joshua took the people of Israel into the promised land. And so there they are. God came through, faithful to his people, always fulfilling his promise. And it's like, you know, Shangri-La, paradise on earth. Except that once they got there and received the law from God, they went back to their old ways. And they rebelled against him and disobeyed his covenant. And eventually, over the course of a few hundred years, uh, they find themselves under the judgment of God again. And he allows them to be taken captive to Babylon, where they are exiles. But people, people like Ezra, people like Zerubbabel and Jeshua, who we're going to see in a minute, they didn't stop believing that maybe someday God would act again, being faithful to his people, fulfilling his promises, and bring them back. And so Ezra is not concerned with giving you a detailed history of all the facts of how Israel repopulated the land of Judah. He's not like some kind of scientific, objective historian. He is forcing you to see God's faithfulness. He has an axe to grind. He has what we call an agenda. He wants you to know that God is faithful to his people and fulfills his promises. And I know this because when he sits down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write his book, look what he says. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia. Ezra roots his whole book in one question. Will God do what he said he was going to do? And Ezra says, yes, he has done exactly what he said. Jeremiah told the people in Jeremiah 25 that after they went away for 70 years into exile, God would bring them back and he would turn Babylon into a desolation. And last school year, we worked our way through the book of Daniel and we got to experience that 70 years of exile. Daniel was taken captive when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and spent 70 years of his life in Babylon, in the king's court. But Ezra picks up where Daniel leaves off with God coming through and being faithful to his word, faithful to his people, and fulfilling his promise. And this is what I think we need to see. Because Ezra had a point, an agenda for God's people then, I think he has the same point for God's people now, that God is faithful to his people and always fulfills his promises. And this is the way he does it. God fulfills his promises through people. God fulfills his If you're the type of person who writes things down, you could write that down. That would make me feel good, like you're going to take this with you and think about it this Thanksgiving week. God fulfills his promises through people. The first person that comes to mind is Cyrus. Right? The Lord stirred the heart of Cyrus, and Cyrus issued a declaration. Go up to Jerusalem and rebuild a temple to the God Yahweh who lives there. And he's kind of got an agenda, too, because he wants to make sure that those people who go end up praying for him and that God would bring his blessing on the empire through their faithfulness to sacrifice to him. But it's pretty amazing to think about this guy, Cyrus. Um, he's a historical figure. You can look him up. His name's Camses in a lot of different documents. Uh, the son of Achaemenes of the Medo-Persian Empire. 
Amazing guy, wonderful world conqueror and ruler, but just so happened to have his heart stirred by the Lord of the Bible so that he would send his people back to Jerusalem. And this didn't come out of anywhere, not out of left field. Um, God had promised 250 years before through the prophet Isaiah that he was going to do this. In fact, if you want to turn over to Isaiah 44, you can. And right here at the end of Isaiah 44, God says in verse 28, It's I who says of Cyrus, he's my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built. And of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed. If you're a Bible person, that word anointed is the same word we get Messiah, his Messiah, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. Listen, God had promised through Jeremiah he was going to bring his people back. And when it came time for him to make good on that promise and fulfill the word he said he was going to do, he did it through Cyrus. He raised Cyrus up to be the leader of the kingdom and stirred his heart so that he would want the people of Israel to go back to their homeland and rebuild the temple. Amazing. But it wasn't just Cyrus. Uh, Later down the line, the people of Israel run into some heartache we're going to see in a second. And another king comes to power, and 15 years later, a guy named Darius is ruling. And Darius issued a decree and found in the annals of Persia where Cyrus had made his declaration. And when he found it and realized that Cyrus had said that, then he said, yeah, I totally agree with that guy. He was a pretty good ruler, and come to think of it, I want to add to it. And so he said in verse 8, I issue a decree concerning what you're to do for these elders of Judah in the rebuilding of this house of God. The full cost is to be paid to these people from the royal treasury out of the taxes of the provinces beyond the river, and that without delay. Whatever's needed, both young bulls, rams, and lambs for a burnt offering to the God of heaven, and wheat, salt, wine, and anointing oil as the priests in Jerusalem request, it's to be given to them daily without fail that they may offer acceptable sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. This is my favorite part. And I issued a decree that any man who violates this edict, a timber shall be drawn from his house, and he shall be impaled on it, and his house shall be made a refuse heap on account of this. That's got some teeth. You're going to give everything these people need to rebuild the house of the Lord, and if not, you're dead. See, God's faithful to his people, fulfilling his promises. And when he gets ready to do it, he uses whoever and whatever he needs. Cyrus, a pagan king, hey, he's my, he's my Messiah, my anointed. Darius, same thing. I'm going to give you everything you need to rebuild the temple. It's amazing when you think about it. And the people saw what God was doing. Down in verse 16, after the people, this is Ezra 6, 16, after the people finally rebuild the temple, they they lift up their voices in praise, and uh, they celebrate and dedicate the house of God with joy. They offered for the dedication of this temple of God 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, corresponding to the number of the tribes of Israel. And Ezra tells us why. Why go through this elaborate celebration? Why offer so many sacrifices? In verse 21 of chapter 6, he says, Because the Lord had caused them to rejoice and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to encourage them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. The people saw it. Here we are, God being faithful to us, fulfilling his promise, bringing us out of exile after 70 years, and he used the king of Assyria. He turned the heart of the king of Assyria so that we could finish our task. They saw exactly what God was doing, that God fulfills his promise through people. And I I think if you think about your life, you would see that this is true. A lot of times we ask God for signs or we're expecting some kind of miraculous divine intervention as God fulfills all those good plans he has for us. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? I'm not the only one that heard that phrase, let go and let God, and just expected him to automatically change me into the person I wish I was. 
Um, instead, what I found is that God brings people into my life who help me become the person he wants me to be, who, who bring about radical change in me. You know, I, at the moment when you meet them, they may seem fairly insignificant. You know, a high school teacher that you just happened to get put in her English class, but who makes an indelible impression in your life, and you're different because of it. You know, a youth pastor, a Sunday school teacher, a spouse. Think about the way God uses people to change us, to fulfill the purpose he has for our lives through people. Insignificant people by most standards. And nevertheless, the people God uses to change us. So God uses people to fulfill his promises. It's not only that, God fulfills his promises despite people. Because, I, you know, I probably painted too rosy of a picture of some of the people I've interacted with in my life. They've changed me, uh, and I, I wish I could have changed them, permanently altered their disposition, but I couldn't. I couldn't. So God fulfills his promises despite people. And the story of Ezra is a story of opposition. Cyrus gives them this freedom to return to Jerusalem, and so they do, and they, they bring back with them all kind of riches and wealth. And when they get there, they, they set about the task of rebuilding the temple, of laying the foundation of the altar, and then starting the work. And in chapter 4, Ezra tells us that when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' households and said to them, Let us build with you, for we, like you, seek your God. And we've been sacrificing to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of that fathers' households of Israel said to them, You have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God. But we ourselves will build together to the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. And then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. The people of the land discouraged, frightened, hired lawyers to oppose the work God's people were doing. Uh, over and over and over, Ezra talks about these people as the people of the land. The people of the land. They were the people who were there when Judah showed back up from their exile. They were people who'd been deported from their homeland by the Assyrians to repopulate the area. And they intermarried with the Jews who had been left behind. Nebuchadnezzar's policy, you may remember this from Daniel, was to take the most elite of the societies he concert, uh, conquered and bring them back to Babylon where he would force them to enter into his service and service of the empire. And so um, the people who were left were not the highest echelon. They were the, they were the people of the land. They were the, the workers, the farmers, the laborers. And over the period of 70 years of exile, these people who remained behind intermarried with the people who had been brought in to repopulate the land. And those people eventually become known as Samaritans, and they were despised by the Jews because they had intermarried and had taken on false worship practices. That's the people of the land Ezra's talking about, people who might have claimed to worship God, but Jesus says to the woman, uh, you don't know the things you worship. We worship in Jerusalem. You worship, you know, at Mount Gerizim. So these people opposed God's people. And in verse 11, that we get a real uh, detailed letter that they send tattletaling to King Cyrus. And, it's, and I'm not going to read it all to you, but it's full of the worst kind of slander. They exaggerate uh, Israel's worst mistakes in their past and, and make false claims about their intentions to rebel against the king. But when the king gets the letter and he reads it and he does a little digging of his own, he discovers that Israel had been really powerful and that they had been in charge of other nations who paid tribute to them. And so he shut the building project down completely, put a halt to it. And this went on for 15 years. The people of Israel were opposed in their rebuilding project. 
Um, this political opposition surely would have been discouraging to them as it is to believers in every nation, whether it's in China or Turkey or Iran. You know, what, what are they trying to accomplish, really? People of Israel are trying to rebuild a temple because they believed, and God had said, that the temple in Jerusalem was the place on earth where his presence could be felt and known. God's people wanted to be near him. They wanted to worship him. And yet, the people opposed them. They got the legal system, the bureaucracy involved. For 15 years, they watched as a half-constructed temple set there. Imagine how discouraging that would be to think, hey, God was faithful to his word and brought us back from exile, and now he's left us high and dry, work half completed. What's he thinking? What's he doing? It wasn't just opposition, though, that God had to work against. It was that people's own weakness, unbelief, and worldliness. Ezra tells us that when um, the first round of exiles came back, they set up, the first thing they did was set up the foundation of the altar so they could offer sacrifices. But he tells us in chapter 3, verse 3, exactly why that's all they did. He says, they set up the altar on its foundation, for they were terrified because of the peoples, the lands. It kind of reminds you of the spies sent in to spy out the promised land and bring back a report to Moses and the people. So that the people are huge, and we're like grasshoppers compared to them. And, you know, Joshua and Caleb said, it's all right. God's on our side. Uh, we'll be okay. We should go and be faithful to what God's called us to do. But the people were terrified, frightened, unable to follow through on what God had called them to, full of unbelief. And so what happens is the, the king, Ahasuerus, gets this letter, and he reads it, and he sends a letter back to these people who oppose him. And down in 423, we find out what these weak, frightened, spineless people do. As soon as a copy of King Artaxerxes' document was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe, and their colleagues, they went in haste to Jerusalem to the Jews and stopped them by force of arms. And then work on the house of God in Jerusalem ceased, and it was stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Here it is. God's brought us here to rebuild this temple. They've got the bureaucrats involved. They're here by force of arms. They've locked us out of our temple. What are we going to do? And then chapters 9 and 10 tell us, we're going to see these next week, when Ezra came back, it wasn't just a, a, a fact of fear, but it was unfaithfulness. That even the priests had intermarried with the women of the land. And they were, they were left to be worldly and unsuitable to work in the temple. And so Ezra has to call them back to repentance. So God fulfilled his purpose despite that, though. Because at the end of the day, God's faithful to his people and fulfills his promise with or without us, you know, in, in spite of us, despite our worldliness and unfaithfulness. And when I read this story, I see myself in it. I see the, the things that I've faced. None of these issues are foreign. That We all know what it means to face opposition. Maybe it's not the people of the land writing letters to our governing authorities, but you know what it's like to, to live in a family where it seems like everything you do is turned against you? You know what it's like to work at a place? You're the only Christian, and so it's kind of hard to fit in, and people don't fail to remind you that you're the only Christian and you don't really fit in. You know what it's like to have a spouse that you just constantly butt heads with, to kids who you can't keep under control? You know, we've all been here. We've done this. We know what it means. We know what it means to struggle against the opposition that comes from within. The sinful desires that we can't seem to shake. You know, they're all right here. And yet God's faithful to his people, and he fulfills his promise despite all that. I mean, if we were looking for perfect people to use, he'd have to look a long time. If we were looking for a perfect church to bless, he'd never find one. God fulfills his promises despite us, not because of us, because he's faithful, not because we're perfect. That's the message of Ezra. He wants the people to look long and hard at this, to remember that it wasn't because you were a great nation, Israel, that I chose you, but you're a stubborn and stick people. The reason I chose you was to glorify my name, to make my name great. That's God's way, to fulfill his promise 
despite us. And so we see this opposition, and in the moment, it seems impossible. How could I ever lead my kids to the Lord when I can't even get them to sit still in church? You know, it's like impossible. Have we even, why even try to sit down to read the Bible with my children? They're going to jump up off the couch. Why should I even try in this marriage anymore? It seems like everything I do is useless. You know, Ezra wants people like us to see this. It doesn't depend on us. It depends on God. He's faithful, fulfills his promises despite people. And then probably the most uncomfortable thing I think I learned from Ezra is that God fulfills his promises on his own timeline. Not when I want it done, but when he decides it's time to be done. And here's what I mean about this. I told you that this this main first project that people have is to rebuild the temple. And by the end of chapter 6, it's complete. And if you're like me, and most of your life you've just read straight through Ezra without any context to the different kings, um, you, you probably thought this all just happened like in the span of a few months or maybe a couple years, let's be realistic. But when I was studying for this and realized that there was a span of 15 years between beginning work under Cyrus and finishing the pro- process under Darius, my mind was absolutely blown. I could, I could not fathom that. It's like crazy to think that God was patient with his people while they were in exile for 70 years. And then he finally brings them back, and it takes 15 years to complete the temple. But get this. Between the end of chapter 6 and the chap- start of chapter 7, is a span of 50 years. The book of Ezra is 80 years from the time the people get back to Jerusalem until they renew their covenant with the Lord and are living faithfully to him again. That's longer than the exile. Because of that, a lot of commentators say that the point of Ezra is to remind us that um, even though the exile was technically over, it was going to continue until the Messiah came. Or you could put it a little more succinctly, it's easier to get the people out of Babylon than it is to get Babylon out of the people. God does things on his own timeline. You think 70 years is up? All right, God, just, hey, bring us back. Let us build the temple. Let's get back to where we were. That's not God's motive. He's not primarily concerned with just bringing his people back to the homeland and giving them a temple again and sacrifice and giving them his law. He knew there was some heart work. You know, heart work is hard work. There was some heart work that had to happen in the people before they could really come home. They needed to discover the cause and effect of prayer. Have you discovered the cause and effect of prayer? We say prayer changes things. Well, as long as the people thought that Cyrus was responsible for them coming home, as long as they thought Darius was the guy they had to thank for the temple finally getting rebuilt, after all, he gave them everything they needed out of the royal treasury. Darius is the one that we should thank. We should send him a big thank you note and a fruit basket. Now, God wanted them to see it was him. But those 15 years of longing to finish the job, don't you think they were full of prayer? There's the kind of Bible prayers that we often read. How long, O Lord, until you come through and fulfill your promise? He had to bring them to that point where they knew that their only hope wasn't political rulers, wasn't kings, wasn't their own ingenuity, their perfection. Their hope was in God alone. That's the heart work he knew he had to do. He knew they needed to learn trust and dependence or they were going to end up right where they were before. So the heart work, which is always the hard work. He's doing what we talked about last Sunday, where he was taking the belief that was up here, and he was driving it down here. Of course they knew Yahweh, maker of heaven and earth, he's the one we worship. But They had to realize what it meant for him to be sovereign over all things, where he could turn the heart of the Assyrian king in his hand. To see that he's the one behind all of human history and everything they have belongs to him. They capture it beautifully in Ezra chapter 3. They say it, I don't know if they meant it or if they believed it. But in Ezra 3.11, they sang praising and giving thanks to the Lord saying, For he is good, for his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. 
And the reason I wonder if they believed this was because they were about as high in that moment as they could get. They had just started the reconstruction of the temple. Everything seemed to be going great. They're lifting their hands, praising, using their tambourines, dancing in the streets. Uh, forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us. Forever. Forever his loving kindness is on Israel. It's easy to say that when things are going good. But I wonder if that was still their song in those 15 years of waiting between the beginning of the temple and when they didn't know if they'd ever get a chance to finish it. And that's what God had to drive into their soul, that he's good all the time. Not just when everything's going swimmingly. When everything looks hopeless, God fulfills his promises in his own time. Not when we think it should. I actually heard this phrase a couple weeks ago in a sermon I was listening to, and it really has stuck with me. That the arc of God's will always bends toward completion. And sometimes that's hard to remember. When, when things are hopeless, things have been hopeless for a lot of people the last two years. Things have looked impossible. And when you're in that moment, when, when, you, when you're in the hole so far, you can't see the light at the top. You have to remind yourself. God fulfills his promises in his own time. The arc of God's will is always bending towards completion. The way the New Testament authors say it is like James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. God could have saved Israel a lot of heartache by taking them back and letting them finish the job right there in chapter 3. But there was a process, some steadfastness that had to be impressed upon them. Their hearts had to be changed. And for them, I, I, you can only imagine because I've been here, the place I want to go looks so close. You know, by the way, the crow flies just a, a, a couple of miles from mountain peak to mountain peak. But in between, there's the valley and the climb back up. And that's what the people of Israel were going through. They were discovering God was working on his own timeline. That, Like James says, he was working in them to change them. I like the way Peter says it in 1 Peter 1.6. Um, in, in 1 Peter 1, Peter begins his letter by reminding God's people of the great thing they've received from God. He calls it an imperishable, undefiled, and unfading inheritance that's kept in heaven and guarded by God's power for people who have faith. Okay? And that inheritance is the living hope through Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. So because of that, we know that everybody who trusts in Christ has a beautiful inheritance stored up in heaven. God's protecting it to the day when he gives it to us, and it is resurrection life in Jesus. And we're looking at that. We're, we're banking on that inheritance. Our hope is set on it. But Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 6, In this inheritance you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God's, God's got a wonderful inheritance for us, y'all. I mean, God's purpose and plan for you is so good. It goes beyond anything you can wrap your mind around. The Bible's description of heaven fail to help us understand how wonderful it is going to be. None of us have seen Jesus face to face, so we can't even imagine how beautiful and glorious he is. None of us have ever had immediate, with, without any sort of intermediary exposure to the presence of God because we're sinful, and if, if we did, we'd be obliterated and melted. But in heaven, we're not even going to have a son because the glory of the Lamb is going to be our light. There's not going to be any tears, not going to be any sickness, not going to be any death. That is our inheritance. That's the promise for us. But he's going to fulfill it in his own time. And on the way to that, there's going to be some stuff, some trials, some fires that are so hot 
It melts us out, taking away impurities from our faith, really refining us until we're the people God wants us to be. So I, I don't know how a person, whether ancient Israelite or modern Christian, makes it in our world without an unshakable confidence that God fulfills his promises in his own time. If I, if I, if I was in charge, I, none of y'all would be going through what you're going through. But I'm not in charge. I'm going through my own stuff. So God fulfills his promises in his own time. And, and I take comfort in that because I look around this room every week and it amazes me that some of y'all didn't know the Lord a year ago. And none of y'all knew the Lord like you know him now. How does he do that? I've been keeping a prayer journal off and on for like 10 or 12 years now. And I can look back in there and see tear blots on my pages where I was so hopeless. And I didn't, I thought maybe God had good plans for my life. But I had, I had really started to wonder. And in that moment, I was pretty sure if God was faithful to people, he wasn't being faithful to me. That if he had good purposes for somebody, he, he didn't have any for me. And now I look back, and I'm blown away. I'm like Joseph. You know, in, in all those moments in prison, in all those moments of slander against me, heartache, God was working for my good. He knew what he was doing. He works on his own timeline and in his own way. I, I think about our living for Jesus, living a legacy renovation plan. Y'all, two years ago on this Sunday, the third Sunday in November 2019, our church family launched a big renovation project, $280,000 worth of repairs. And I remember at the time, I'm a, this is my first time, some of y'all are new and you don't know this, this is my first time being a senior pastor. And so I do things sometimes without knowing how silly and foolish they are. And I was convinced that God was calling us to that renovation thing. In the back of my mind, I heard voices of doubt. This is foolish. This is naive. How, how's this church going to come up with a whole extra budget in two years? But we launched it. We got the first gifts, which were generous, and with some cash we had already as a church, we were able to make some big progress. And I remember telling our administrative team, hey, y'all, I know we got a long way to go. We were like $150,000 short of what we need to do all this. But, hey, God's given us everything we need to do what he's calling us to do right now. When the time comes, he'll provide. And I said that knowing that that's what a pastor's supposed to say. You know, if you don't believe it, just project. That's, you know, that's terrible advice. But that's what I did a little bit, okay? Just to be transparent with you, that's what I did. God's given us everything we need to do what he's calling us to do right now. And then a few months later, like three months later, coronavirus becomes a thing. And we're like, what do we get? You know, it seemed naive and foolish to try to do that before. But, hey, nobody knows what's going to happen with this. Let's just put everything on pause. But y'all know God's faithful to his people. He fulfills his promises. He gives us exactly what we need to do what he's calling us to do in every moment. And he didn't stop doing that, just that first roof project. But here we are two years later. More money's been given than we needed. We've been able to do more. The, the sanctuary is completely painted as of this week, and the sound is going to be installed in two weeks, the second week of December. And, you know, I was thinking about it this morning. Some of y'all were on that administrative team when we launched it. And the, ball, the, the thing that got the ball rolling on our renovation was the need we had for up, upgraded and improved sound system. And I remember sitting around the table, I think it was my first sun, Sunday meeting with y'all, I said, hey, if we're about to spend $40,000 on our church facility, is this the $40,000 we need to be spending? And they were like, no. And so we're like, okay, well, let's not do that now. Let's do what we need to do. And it hit me this morning. 
we did everything we needed to do, and we're getting a sound system anyway. And it just blows your mind, God's faithfulness and the way he fulfills his promises beyond what we can expect in his own timeline. Why? Not because I'm a perfect pastor or we're a perfect church or because I was praying right and living right. None of that. It's because God wants to glorify himself by proving himself strong through things that are weak. I put it like this. God fulfills his promises for the good of the world. For the good of the world. That's the point. I mean, you you think about God's people coming back to Jerusalem, which before was in ruins, no stone left on top of another. And one commentator said, imagine, had God decided to send his son Jesus to the people of Israel while they were in exile, would he have had the same effect if instead of strolling into the reconstructed temple, he had walked into a Babylonian ziggurat? No way. God saw the big picture of what he was trying to do. He saw beyond a temple. He saw beyond 40,000 returning exiles. He saw the world. And he knew that in his wisdom, providence, sovereignty, he had a plan from before time began that he was going to save a people from every nation, tribe, and language through the death of his son, Jesus. And he knew that Jerubbabel, Jeshua, they'd end up back in Jerusalem, and they'd rebuild a temple, and 450 years later, a little baby would be presented there. And a prophetess named Anna, who'd been praying night and day for 87 years for the Messiah, would get to see him. He knew 12 years later, a little boy would go with his parents to Jerusalem at Passover. When they got back home, or halfway there, they realize he's not in the caravan, and they'd go back and find him. He'd be sitting at the feet of the teachers saying, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? A couple decades later, he'd be a grown man. He'd fashion a whip out of cords and go in the same temple, driving out the money changers and saying, didn't you know my house would be a house of prayer for the nations? That he'd come in from Bethany with a crowd of rambunctious kids. Hosanna, blessed is the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The religious leaders from the temple would say, hey, shut those kids up. And he'd say, even if I did, even the rocks would cry out. He knew he'd be crucified in the shadow of the temple after he'd overlooked it and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, how long I've Wish that I could gather you under my wing like a mother hen gathers her brood, but you were unwilling. See, God brought this story to a head in Ezra to remind his people that there were bigger things at play than they could even comprehend. Imagine it was easy for him to get self-centered, self-absorbed in all that God was doing, just like it is for me and you. I think that that my happiness, my security, my future is in my hands and in what I can accomplish today. But God's concerned with more, and he sees things from a bigger perspective. So, look, I know that there are a lot of people here today whose thanksgivings are going to be tough. And you're tempted to wonder if God cares about you. And I just want to be one voice to say he does. That he does. He's faithful to his people, and he always fulfills his promises. The opposition at work from your family can't keep him from finishing the work he's begun in you. Your weakness and insecurity and anxiety and sin and sadness, that can't separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing can. And just because it hasn't happened yet, whatever it is you're hoping for and trusting for and believing in, it doesn't mean it's not going to. That God's timing is perfect. And he's always going to fulfill his promise. He'll conform you perfectly to the image of his son. He'll exalt you at the proper time. He'll supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. He's going to build his church and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against us. The book of Ezra gives us concrete proof that trust in God like that is never misplaced.
He's faithful to his people, and he fulfills his promises. So listen, this week, plant your feet on the bedrock of God's word. Right in here. Plant your feet here. Stand on it. Trust it. Believe that the promises here are true. The same God who came through for the people of Israel will come through for you. Let his goodness in the past give you hope for the future. You know, I was thinking about this. I did that. Some of y'all saw my silly Facebook Live video. And I thought about that thing people do sometimes where they sit in front of a camera and record a video for their children or for their grandchildren so they can know them. I was thinking, what if you film one of those for yourself? Like after God did something amazing in your life, what if you sat down in front of your smartphone, you press record on your camera, and you said, hey, look, Brad, I know you're going through it right now, but let me just tell you what God did today. So that next time you were discouraged, you were able to pull out your phone and see yourself in a totally different frame of mind, totally convinced of God's goodness. I think that would be really powerful. Uh, Or maybe you need to do the gratitude journal thing. This week, every day, write down five things you're thankful for so that in the future, when you're struggling, you can go back to them. But most of all, do this. On Thursday, when you gather with your people, wherever it is, will you offer up a prayer of thanks to God because he's faithful to his people, because he fulfills his promises? Y'all pray with me.